Hey guys, Coach here. Welcome to this week's episode. I appreciate you taking a couple of minutes. Hey, this week we're talking about something just a little bit different as far as raw land. Everybody searching out that American dream. And not just American, it could be on any continent in this earth. But you got a piece of land. You're going to put your dream home on it or your dream vacation cabin or whatever. Well, what we're talking about is the initial landscaping it's going to take in order for you to do it correctly, comfortably, safely, and get everybody in and off your property correctly. Are you with me? Let's get going. If it happens to be applicable to you, congratulations. Hey, maybe you're watching this because you've done just that. You went out and got yourself a few acres, two, five, ten, whatever it might be. And this is where you're going to put your forever home, your vacation cabin getaway, and make some memories on this beautiful piece of property that you and your significance have said, this is it. Here's some things I want to cover though, as you approach your new land. Now you guys fell in love with this thing for whatever reason, probably a reason only you guys can describe. But what I have seen in my experience, having done a lot of landscaping and contracting over the years and doing quite a bit of traveling is people tend to shortcut the development of that property. And when I say shortcut, we're going to talk about the five, the big five as far as what I have seen and some suggestions I might make in order to develop your raw land property so that everything works on all eight cylinders all the time. So if you don't think raw land development isn't landscaping, it really is. It is basically approaching a piece of ground, a piece of landscape and altering it in an improving type of fashion. That's what landscaping is, whether it's on a little 50 by 100 foot lot or a five acre piece of raw land, you're landscaping it. So let's talk about those top five. And I kind of listed them in order of importance and in order of progression when it comes to mm, getting things underway, shall we say. Okay, so first one, beyond anything most important is you have to have an entry driveway, an entry apron, and you have to do it in such a manner that if you're on a rural country road, a dirt road, a paved road, whatever it is, you have to get off of that public roadway and onto your private property correctly. What I see most of all is people undersize it, undersize it terribly, like having a 20 foot widths or 18, even 15 foot widths. And what I would really rather suggest to you is to really flare out that apron, flare it out really wide. And here's why your little SUV or whatever you drive is not going to be the only vehicle leaving that roadway and coming onto your property as you get things underway. And you're going to see why in just a few minutes, you want to have something that any 18 wheeler, any big fifth wheel RV, towing a boat, whatever it might be, is comfortably able to transition. And the way you transition is you widen that out and you flare that driveway apron out. I would suggest a minimum flare of 30 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet if you can get it. Picture this, and this is kind of how I used to teach it just a little bit. You're building and on your building, you're going to have to put some roof trusses and those things are going to be delivered on a very long flatbed tractor trailer. That person is going to have to back onto your property or pull onto your property in such a fashion that they can safely get up your driveway. That apron, the wider, the better when it comes to it. Now your apron also serves something else too, and that's probably some form of drainage along the roadway on the side of your property. So you're going to have to get a culvert underneath there as well. Make sure however you make this driveway apron, whether it be uh, rock and gravel, uh, some type of retaining stone where the culvert is, or you concrete the whole thing in, whatever your checkbook allows you to do, you do it with a lot of uh, compaction. You do it with a lot of fill over the top of your culvert and make sure your culvert is capable of handling the amount of water 
that comes through that area during the big heavy rains. Not just that little quarter incher. I'm talking four inches of rain or something like that. You don't want it to overflow. You don't want it to, to erode away at your very expensive driveway apron. So make sure that we flared it, we've put our culvert in, and we've covered it with a substantial amount of road base and aggregates so that big heavy machinery can get in there and necessary. So I got a little personal experience with this. Weed Patch Ranch, when Maestro and I bought that thing, uh, one thing that this Donkey Kong previous owner that I bought from, one of the many things that they did not do correctly was they didn't do a good driveway apron. 12 feet. Now, it was made out of concrete. It was done really, really sturdy, but it just was not wide enough. Not wide enough at all. And over the years that we lived there, we had uh, gravel trucks, big transfer trucks. We had uh, cement trucks uh, coming on there. We had uh, tractor trailer rigs delivering stuff for the, the business. And man, I'll tell you what, kudos to the people that were backing in there because some of them, they had literally less than half a foot on either side when they were doing it. So remember that apron, 30 to 40 feet wide. Make sure you have it nice and sturdy. Let's move on to number two, and that is the driveway itself. Now, some of you may have uh, purchased raw land that it's flat as a tabletop, okay? Some of you may have rolling 10 acres, okay? And some of you may have bought hillsides that you have to get up to because your building site and another beautiful potential is up at the top of the property and you have to navigate your way up there. The driveway is the way you're gonna do it. And what you're gonna do is don't shortcut this as well. This has to be wide. Now, you may not be able to attain the perfect 18 to 20 foot width. You might not be able to do that for one reason or another. You're gonna to have to give it some width. Remember that trusses truck. They're gonna to have to transition up there. Maybe a cement truck, maybe a a family member with a big diesel truck and a 40-foot fifth wheel. Whatever it might be, they have to be able to navigate up this thing. The driveway has to get excavated out. Get rid of all the soft soils and stuff. And then you have to come in and create a driveway that's going to be at least six to eight inches thick of a good compactable road base. And then on top of that, just a couple inches of three-quarter inch gravel or whatever you can find. Now, this has to be done with some heavy machinery, obviously. You're not gonna be able to cut a driveway with a pick and shovel. That's not something most people are gonna do in this day and age. So you may have to bring on a pro to come in here, and they're gonna to have to come in with a, a D4 Caterpillar. They're gonna to have to come in with a Bobcat. They're gonna to have to come in with whatever they might have to use. Make sure that you request width, not 12 feet. If you can get that thing bigger than 15 feet wide, you're doing really, really well. And that way you're gonna have the ability to direct, maybe even through the, the use of an architect, maybe a surveyor, a way to get onto your property and navigate it so you don't have any sharp hairpin turns or uh, obstacles like trees, boulder outcroppings, that kind of thing. Really walk that property well and make sure that you take somebody uh, maybe a pro that can outline it for you and make sure that you're not running into big pine trees and oak trees and maple trees. You may have to do some thinning. You may have to even do some removal, but that's part of developing raw land. Make sure you don't throw all that wood and everything away. You just might want to use it later on. Maybe it's big enough to where you can use it for lumber for yourself or you may be able to use it just for firewood. Not only in the driveway width, but also keep in mind the driveway drainage. If you're on any sort of a flat surface that accumulates water, like where we're at right now, or if you're on a hillside that constantly percolates water down the hill, you're gonna wanna have a good drainage slot on one side of your driveway, minimum of probably 12 inches deep. Rip wrap that that culvert area and make sure you put lots of discharge culverts across the driveway to safely and sanely discharge that water without compromising that very expensive driveway that you're putting in. 
Okay, so driveway width, driveway drainage. Number two, let's move on to number three. I kind of debated about where to put number three because sometimes it can be uh, almost more important than number one. But for number three, we're looking at parking. Whatever you do, if you think that you need 20 feet, double it. If you can triple it, the better. Everything is based on that trusses delivery truck. They want a place to turn around. They want a place that is safe. They're not gonna sink. Maybe they're offloading materials with a crane. Maybe they got heavy, heavy cement mixers coming in there. You're gonna wanna have a parking and driveway area that opens up very, very wide and is really well done, just like your driveway and your driveway apron. Don't skimp on this. What you have initially will seem big enough, but you have to futuristically look at it as far as when the house is there, when some of your things, your toys, your whatever, your sheds, your barn, whatever, it's gonna eat up parking area really fast. So think futuristic. What are gonna be your immediate needs up there for parking, your first year needs, and then subsequent years as you enjoy the property and whatever you build there. Generally, the parking, the parking area is always undersized because people don't have the vision of how much room it really might take. Now, the size that you can actually attain is gonna be uh, determined by a couple of things. Property lines, maybe. Uh, diggability. Can you actually excavate the area out? Maybe you only have... Uh, a couple inches of soil and you're into bedrock for gosh sakes. Now it doesn't mean it can't be done, but it sure does increase the cost of something like that. But do whatever you can and make whatever you can. And if you can go bigger, go big or go home. It really is important. Parking, number three. All right, let's move on to number four. Number four is basically surrounds clearing, grading, and views. Clearing is gonna be one of the biggest things that you're gonna start off with. You may be starting off with something that looks like what's behind the camera right here, and you're gonna to have to clear that driveway. You're gonna to have to stump out a lot of trees. You're gonna to have to debrush a lot of area. And the real good thing about that is as you spend more time doing this, you will start to get a literally a feel of where things need to go, what things are gonna be needed, and you can plan accordingly. You know, it's one thing to flag out a driveway, but as you start to do it, what are your angles, what are your curves, and what are your capabilities after you've cleared things out? You know, the new friends that we're staying with right now, they brought in a uh, forestry mulcher. And what's behind the camera is what they have cleared. And basically it's been, it's been cleared to a lot of upright trees. A lot of big oaks and big pines. What you see behind me is what their property looked like when they started here. You can't walk through there without getting tied up in flooded, flooded soils, uh, bramble, vines, etc. Maybe you have some of the same situation. You have to clear it out. You literally have to get it to where you can see the forest through the trees. And once you do, oftentimes your roadmap almost takes on a a personality of its own and you will see exactly where you need to go what you need to keep and what you don't need to keep now when you talk about grading grading is going to apply to the steepness of your driveway if you have that type of property it's also going to be grading out where your home site's going to be and it's also going to be dealing with slope and drainage again if you happen to get a piece of property that's on a hilly slope and you're dealing with more upslope above where the house is gonna be, you're gonna to have to think a little bit about diverting water around where your homestead is gonna be. You know, that's gonna be done with ditching, that's gonna be done with drain lines and French drains. It might be done with directing water to a particular mechanical sump basin and pumping water around where your dwelling is gonna be, whatever it might take. But think it out, know it before you start getting into other phases, because the last thing you want is creating a, a working environment for contractors or yourself where everything is just swamped out and you can't do anything about it. Maybe your front yard kind of looks like this right here, 
and you just can't do anything on there for weeks and months because it's flooded. You got six inches of standing water around. You can't put animals out there. You can't put yourself out there. And you're basically with hip waders relegated to going out into the yard itself. So let's talk about views. You know, views, once you start clearing things out, you just might see things that are, weren't initially available to you, weren't initially apparent to you at all. Now, views can be a good thing and views can be a bad thing. And yes, I said bad because not all views are picturesque. Sometimes after you've bought your property, you may end up with neighbors adjoining you or across from you and they don't have the same, uh, let's say, property hygiene that you plan on having. And your views might be of a car junkyard. It might be a, a pig farm. Yeah, I shouldn't pick on pig farms because, you know, oftentimes they're very professionally run and very well cleaned. But maybe junk and trash and just one of those houses that's that house has moved in across from you. Those are the kind of views you may want to obscure rather than highlight. So as you do all this clearing and everything else, you might want to see, oh boy, we better get some things in the ground and we be able to screen that off. So views. Now, if you have views that you did not see, but you dropped a few trees here and there and you opened something up, there's something that you want to enhance and it may cause you to uh, reevaluate the placement of your home, how it's going to be oriented on the property itself. Okay, let's move on to number five, something that uh, I actually had personal experience with, and that is raw land security. As you start to develop your dream place, you want to keep in mind that as construction starts, you want to keep an eye towards security. Construction sites and new folk moving in are always on the, on the radar of thieves. And just because you put a gate down at the bottom of your beautifully wide driveway apron does not mean that you won't have people seeing what you got. Uh, you may preclude them from driving up to your new cabin or home, but that does not mean that when you return back to your nine to five or you're off for a weekend of skiing or whatever, doesn't mean that they can't walk up there. Now we can't prevent everything all the time, but at least what you can do is get ahead of it a little bit. I really suggest that you get some lighting up there, get some cameras up there, and vary your schedule, both you and your professionals that you're bringing in. Vary your schedule and make sure your property is posted, okay, so that you're standing on legal ground. If you don't, if it's not posted, Many times people can walk on there. Now, when I say personal experience, I was on a job site um, in Northern California. I was in a new development. My customer had just bought a custom home lot, had just built a custom home, and I was doing the landscaping before they moved in. So every night, I either had to put everything back in my trailer and trailer at home, which in hindsight I probably should have done, but instead I put everything in the garage. The garage had a garage door, it had a lockable side door, it didn't matter. Thieves came in one night, broke in through the back door, and pro you know, proceeded to try to take dishwashers out, refrigerators out, and then went in and found all my equipment and took roughly about $6,000 worth of tools and a lot of materials I needed to finish the job. So yeah, would I ever have cameras and lighting set up again? You're damn right I would. By the way, they didn't get the appliances out. They were too big to go through the garage door. So site security. Think about it before you even break ground. Okay, and now a bonus for you. How about utilities? Utilities for some rural properties means uh, you got to create your own. Uh, maybe you don't have power to the road where you're buying your rural property. Maybe you're going to have to go off grid and that's one way. So for many of you, you're probably going to have some kind of uh, uh, power at the road and you're going to have to bring it in. And really the only thing you have to think about is you're going to do it on a pole and bring it up to your home site or you're going to do it underground. As far as DIYing it, underground is relatively easy. Following local guidelines and what authorities say that you have to, if your ground is trenchable and you can get down to depth, 
trench that trench wherever you need to go. Get yourself the gray conduit, the Schedule 80 conduit that you can put in the ground. Put a pull rope through it so when the utility company comes out, you, they can bring it down the pole into your conduit and pull it all the way to the, the home site. Then when you're burying it, put it back over, put a marking tape there about 12 inches above where your conduit is, and you should be pretty good. Just remember to follow your local codes and hey, DIYers can do that fairly well. You can also put in the utility poles yourself. As long as you can go find an auger, auger it down, buy the poles from local suppliers, put them in according to code, and then the utility company can come in and stretch the wire wherever it needs to go. Hey guys, raw land development is a daunting task, but you know something? Thinking it out from the very get-go, controlling your excitement and your exuberance, and tempering it with good, well-thought-out plans and designs, bringing in pros when you need to, and making sure you take your time and do it right the first time, it can be a very enjoyable, enjoyable endeavor. It'll tend to lower the stress a meter quite a bit because you've thought it out and you know what you're expecting. If I can help in any way, I'm only an email away. Youryardcoach at gmail.com. Don't forget to check out the website. Plan of the week is right here as well. And if you're on the go, hey, take me out on the podcast. If you really got some value out of this, I would appreciate a like and please subscribe. Come out here every Friday to let you know a little bit of education on how you can landscape your property in a DIY style. Thanks for joining me. I'll catch you guys next week. As always, to your landscape success, and bye for now.